We need a new system. We need a new society. We need to demand that which may have sounded impossible even a few weeks ago, but is not only realizable, but an imperative necessity. Russia's October Revolution in 1917 and the rise of Soviet power reverberated across the world from Latin America to Africa to Asia and the Middle East, that part of the world that lived under the ravages of colonialism and underdevelopment. Welcome to this week's episode of The Real Story on the Socialist Program. I'm your host, Brian Becker. Today is part two of our series, The Rise and Fall of the Soviet Union and Lessons for Socialists. Today we'll be discussing the impact of the Russian Revolution on the people of the world who lived under the yoke of colonial domination. We'll be talking with Vijay Prashad. He is the executive director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, chief editor of Leftward Books, a prolific author, and the author of Red Star Over the Third World. Vijay Prashad, welcome to the Socialist Program. It's a great honor to be on a program called The Socialist. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, we're doing a multi-part series on the rise and fall of the Soviet Union and lessons for socialists. Uh, you know, there's a rise in interest in socialism, Bernie Sanders, I mean here in the United States, the Bernie Sanders campaign coming after Occupy, Black Lives Matter movement, the crisis of capitalism following the 2008 crash on Wall Street, a rise in interest in socialism, and people are joining socialist groups, organizations, parties of all types. But ultimately, socialists will be confronted by those who are the defenders of capitalism or the apologists of capitalism with the issue of the Soviet Union. They point to the Soviet Union and say, look, socialism may have been a good idea, perhaps a great dream, but in reality, it was nothing other than a gray totalitarian nightmare uh, that killed millions, and ultimately, it was overcome by a counter-revolution. And that's the end of the story. And so, understanding that the interest in socialism the need to understand and define socialism also requires an objective appraisal of the Soviet Union because the narrative about the Soviet Union has been strictly negative, at least here in the United States. The reason I wanted to uh, talk to you in particular is I read your book, which I will hold up for the audience. It's called Red Star Over the Third World. Uh, it's an amazing book, and I want to recommend uh, to all of our listeners and watchers that they get this book. Mm. Uh, but let's just talk about the title, Red Star Over the Third World. I want to preface this with just a comment or two, though, for, again, for our audience. When Lenin wrote a short pamphlet, it's really an entry for an encyclopedia in 1913 called Three Sources and Three Components of Marxism. And it was for an encyclopedia. It wasn't for a Marxist journal. Uh, Lenin says, German philosophy, meaning Hegel and Fairbach, historical materialism, British political economy, and French socialism or utopian socialism, the other, these are the three sources of Marxism. But after the Russian Revolution, Marxism changes. And you no longer look here we are in 2021, simply to Germany or to France or to Britain, but we think about China or before that Russia or Cuba or Vietnam or Korea. In other words, the parts of the world that were colonized or semi-colonized, the underdeveloped parts of the world. So when I saw your book, Red Star Over the Third World, this of course is the theme of your book. So let's just talk about your premise in writing the book. Well, Brian, the first thing I want to say is that it was extraordinary in 1917, 1918, over 100 years ago. It was extraordinary 
for very poor people, you know, children of peasants, children of domestic workers, children of factory workers and so on, um, to come out on the street as themselves factory workers and peasants, people with very limited access to uh, education, limited access to nutrition, limited access to an understanding of the world, to come out on the street and say, we refuse to fight a war that we don't want, the so-called great war. We refuse to go hungry. In fact, not only do we refuse all these things, but we're going to overthrow the czar and make our own government. That's an extraordinary feat, you know, repeated in human history very rarely when people with dirt under their fingernails say, I refuse to be commanded by somebody who smells like French perfume and can recite the, you know, classics and so on. That's an extraordinary thing. And, and I feel like, you know, in the ruins of 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, that sense has been forgotten, you know. But mm -hmm. before 1917, we really don't have that experience. Yes, it's true. In Mexico, Zapata, uh, you know, rides into Mexico City. Here he is from the countryside, a peasant, dust on his shoulders. Even they overthrow the government. You know, but then Zapata says, hey, listen, I'm fed up with the city. And he goes back home, you know. But there was a revolution in Mexico as well in 1911. There was a considerable revolution in China in 1911 when the Republicans said, we don't want, you know, the, the, the emperor to rule us anymore. Uh, goodbye, emperor. Welcome to the republic. There was a revolution in Iran in 1911. Now, people can say, look, there was the French Revolution in 1789. There was the Haitian Revolution in 1804. All of that is true. But what was so significant about the Russian Revolution is not only did ordinary people come and push aside the Tsar, but they said we're going to create an egalitarian society, a socialist society. That's really unbelievable. And the inspiration that that provided for people coming from Indochina, later Vietnam, people coming from, you know, uh, South America, people coming from Africa, the inspiration it provided was that peasants could make a modern revolution. Peasants could come and overthrow uh, monarchies, but also colonialism, because after all, large parts of the Soviet Union were used to be a colony of the Tsarist Empire, like Central Asia and so on. But these were the things, the inspiration that came out of the Russian Revolution. You know, in, in Western Europe or in parts of Europe, the lesson was different because right after the success of the Russian Revolution, there was the defeat of the German Revolution. So the aftermath of 1917-18 in Europe was a sense of despair. But in the rest of the world, there was jubilation. So that even left nationalists, people like Jawaharlal Nehru, traveling around the Soviet Union 1927, says, my God, what have these people done? Yesterday they were peasants. Today they have literary societies in their villages. They're sitting in their villages and reading. Let me tell you, Brian, when the British left India, the literacy rate was 13%. 13%. 400 years of British rule off and on, 13% literacy rate. The Soviets accelerated literacy. It was a an illiterate society in 1917, they accelerated literacy to near 100% uh, before the Soviet Union collapsed. And, and the last thing I'll say about this, the Soviet Union existed for less than the average life expectancy in most countries today. It only existed for 70 years. You know, people uh, judge these experiments with such a harsh ideological attitude. They don't want to see what did these people accomplish in 70 years? What they want to just say is it was a failure. And I think that's a failure of the imagination, not of the Soviet Union. Vijay, um, very much appreciate your, your comments. The last comment in particular, people have to remember that uh, when the Soviet Union, well, the Russian Revolution happened in 1917, the Soviet Union as a formal legal entity is created in the early 1920s. Um, but at the time of the Russian Revolution, the Russian economy was about one-twelfth the size of the U.S. economy. By 1970, the second largest economy in the world and the first country to go into outer space. 
and the first country to be able to match the United States in military uh, hardware, assuming sort of a, a, a near parity, uh, a very big expense, but quite an achievement given the fact that the Soviets were determined not to be reinvaded as they were by, by German fascism in 1941. And at the same time, workers, everyone had a right to a job. You were guaranteed a right to affordable housing. I think housing could never be more than 6% of your income or something like that. Uh, that doesn't mean there wasn't cramped housing or a housing shortage. Uh, there was, child care was free. Uh, maternity care for moms was a year or, or two years of child care wasn't immediately available at your workplace. You got a vacation, a one month long vacation when you started employment. I mean, reason enough for a revolution, right? And uh, these are all done under the circumstances of competing in a very hostile international environment. And the other thing that I think is so important in your book that you cover is the social transformation. Here you have a society that's uh, predominantly peasant, and the peasantry is predominantly super poor, very illiterate for the most part, even in Russia, not the, not the non-Russian republics. And I, I mentioned last week in the show that I think it was in Uzbekistan that like the literacy rate was 2% or something like that in 1917. And by 1970, Uzbekistan had more college graduates per capita than France. I mean, the social advance, uh, unlike anything that happened anywhere else in the world, in such a short amount of time. You know, when I was a young boy in Bengal in the 1970s, um, the access to books was limited because India at the time, paper costs were high and Indian publishers weren't publishing a lot. So I was able to get books at great, uh, you know, uh, very cheap books from progress publishers, uh, which would set up stalls all across the city and these very nice Russian people would come and they would tell us about the books. Um, I bought, you know, books, my parents also, but I bought Turgenev, I bought Tolstoy, I read the great novels. You know, I, I began with those novels, not with um, Jane Austen and, and things which I found later, Charles Dickens and so on. I, I cut my teeth on Tolstoy. And reading Tolstoy, you know, Brian, you get a real sense of the depravity of Russian uh, well, let's just call it feudalism, but serfdom and, and so on. Um, one of the books in particular really impacted me, Resurrection, about this domestic servant and the way she was treated by a minor count. Hideous exploitation, ruthless exploitation of people. You know, Tolstoy is writing in the period just before, um, you know, the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party is set up when brave people, you know, one of my favorite characters of the Russian Revolution uh, Cecilia Bobrovskoya, who operated as a courier for Lenin, it, with, at great cost, people like her uh, fought to build her political party. They built the trade unions. Uh, they went to jail. They passed, you know, pamphlets around and so on. It was in a hideous social condition that they had to operate. Bobrovskoya herself grew up in the Pale, you know, where Jews were being put into these enclosed ghettos and her parents lived hand to mouth existence and she and many people like her got deeply radicalized by the hopes of marxism and so on and, and they fought against those horrible social conditions so when the ussr was set up two things are important i want to emphasize two things immediately one is that it immediately meant that this new state had to commit itself uh, to eradicating illiteracy, to eradicating ill health as much as possible, to eradicating starvation because of the, in fact, tangible experience of people like Bobrovskoya. It was not a theoretical thing. You know, uh, people like Stalin, Bobrovskoya, uh, Khrushchev, they came from very poor families. Stalin's mother was a domestic worker. You know, they had experienced hideous uh, treatment by the petty aristocracy and so on. So they committed their state to putting as much of the social uh, wage as possible towards improving people's lives. That's the first thing. Literacy was a very key part of their project, as it was key to Cuba. Again, moved to 100 percent 
literacy very fast through the Cuba literacy project. It was key to Afghanistan. You know, we can talk about how uh, how shambolic the left government was in Afghanistan, and yet thousands of young people volunteered to go into the countryside to build literacy, and they were the ones picked off by the U.S.-backed Mujahideen coming across the border from Pakistan. They went into those villages and started a terror campaign against literacy workers. But this is what the Soviets did. But the second thing that happened in the USSR or the Soviet Republic in the early years was that artists, cultural workers, a range of people from Mayakovsky, of, of course, was the most interesting. But, you know, Eisenstein, these directors, they suddenly felt we need to create a new language, whether it's a cinematic language. I mean, look at the breakthroughs of Eisenstein. The cinematic language was different. The poet... Poets said, we can't talk the way we used to talk, you know. We can't talk this language of like subservience to the Lord. We have to create a democratic language. Their poetry exploded. So culturally and socially, there was a major transformation. You know, in the book, I write about Krupskaya walking into a meeting, coming out and saying, my God, these peasant women, they were yelling and screaming you see, it's very interesting, Brian. I read an article some years ago about the U.S. civil rights movement. And in the civil rights movement, um, one of the things that's quite compelling is there's a discussion about, you know, uh, uh, you know, Rosa Parks on the bus and so on. Well, you know, on the buses, you could segregate people and say, hey, listen, you sit at the back of the bus, but you can't segregate my voice. So people started to talk loudly on buses and so on, annoying the passengers in the front. That's a kind of sonic protest. Imagine this. You have this, you know, this turn to say that, look, your domestic servant can also be an educated person now. They are going to talk back to you. In fact, we're going to have a situation where you don't, you can't have a domestic servant any longer. And all of that, that's a powerful transformation um, in the Russian Empire and then, of course, in the USSR. And, and the upper classes, when they lose their servants, when they lose their land, when they lose their second home, because the, the government is creating not only new language but new laws, and, and it's sort of a redistribution. Uh, I, I was in Moscow in 1991, a couple weeks after the end, after Yeltsin helped torpedo the socialist project. And I, and I met some people um, who were very excited. Most of the workers who I talked to were very confused. They didn't know what had happened and they didn't know what was coming. But I talked to a couple of people who were very excited about the collapse or the ex destruction of the Soviet Union. And every one of them I talked to explained to me that they had property, that their grandparents had property that had been taken from them in 1917 and given to poor people. And they still weren't over it. This was 1991. They were still like, That's, those were my homes. Those, that, that was my land. So you have the element of, of class warfare in a way that's unavoidable. And it gives the, the new project a brittleness. And, and in the case of the Soviet Union, it wasn't simply brittle. It was a campaign of terror directed against the new socialist government. So as you mentioned, like the, after the Sour Revolution in Afghanistan, where literacy workers were assassinated by the Mujahideen, so-called, when they came to the villages, the same thing was happening to the young Bolsheviks who went to the countryside to be with the poor peasants, who were another major factor in the revolution. It wasn't simply a workers' revolution by any stretch. Uh, it was, as Engels had called for, the second edition of the peasant war in Germany. It really was a peasant revolution that, that coincided with the workers' uprising. Those uh, young people were also uh, liquidated. They were assassinated by the white terror. And the Soviets, the Russian, the revolutionaries, they respond with what was called red terror. And, you know, Lenin was projecting a commune state when he wrote State and Revolution. He talks a lot about it. But under conditions of civil war, uh, even with major social achievements, there's very little room for, quote, democracy. A war is a war. And nothing uh, resembles one side of a war as much as the other side of a war because you're fighting a war. It's either you win or you die. And so here you have this amazing social experimentation or the, the artists and, and intelligentsia finding new language or... And they were so 
rambunctious. I think you said in your book that Lenin called them the hooligan communists uh, because they were trying everything. Everything was new, uh, just as happened after the French Revolution in 1789, this flowering, this cultural revolution. And yet at the same time, the project is constrained by the reality of class war, that even if the Soviets want to take a gentle uh, step forward, a, a gradual step forward, they're not in charge of the pace of events. There is no such thing as a gradual step, really, because, you know, even as you say, a small step is going to be met by the rigidities of the world order. You know, I use the word rigidity advisedly. Um, elites are rigid about the um, or jealous of their power. They don't want to share their power, their property, their privileges. They're jealous of it. You know, if anybody steps in or steps across the line, they must be put in their place. Um, we, we forget the Russian Revolution, Brian. Look at small gestures. You'll get a you know a, a left-leaning person coming to power. Okay, let's talk about Alex Tsipras bringing the Syriza coalition to power in Greece. They try to move a small agenda. You know, they say, look, don't suffocate us. Let us be able to have a financial fiscal policy where we can do some things in Greece. People are not being paid pensions. They are struggling and so on. They send their finance minister, uh, Yanis Varoufakis, to Germany to negotiate. And the bankers just tell them, go home and make the cuts. We don't care. You know, essentially what Varoufakis said at that time is useful. Varoufakis said, the coups today, and he's talking about Europe, are not done by, by tanks. The coups today are done by banks. It's one and the same thing. Elites are just so rigid about the need to hold on to power that when they lose power, they are vicious in trying to regain it. And I really feel, Brian, that the books that were written in the 100th year anniversary of the, of the Soviet Union, of the revolution of 1917, so many of the books underplay the extent of the terror. Uh, even I'm guilty of that, but that was not my brief. I was interested in what the Russian revolution meant to the rest of the world. But the underplaying of the terror is significant. And... People just think a revolution is a picnic. Remember who said it's not a picnic. It's going to be a real battle. It's going to be tough. It's tough again in several vectors. One, the old rigidities come back and try and suffocate you. Everybody invaded the USSR. Everybody. The, everybody by which I mean the major powers. You know, the Americans were there, the British, the French. Everybody sent somebody. And I, you know, read some extraordinary little stories from Central Asia where pe people would show up on their horse, you know, some, again, petty aristocrat would show up on the horse and tell the, the, the newly freed uh, serfs, come on, get into the army behind me or in front of me and let's go fight the Red Army. And the serfs were like, listen, they just gave us the land. What are you promising? A return to serfdom? Forget it. When, so instead of their own former serfs, they had British soldiers or or you know, in, in some cases, Cossacks coming uh, on their side and, and or Iranian Cossacks, actually, including the ancestors of the Shah uh, coming and joining the, the fight against the USSR. That's one set of rigidities. The other set of rigidities is that you've made a revolution. The Bolsheviks make a revolution. There's no capital. You know, there, there's just no capital. The access to capital is not there. You're a poor country. How are you going to build socialism out of poverty? You're not going to socialize poverty. You have to do something with the productive forces. You have to build the factories up and so on. You don't have any capital. You know, you, you don't have access to it. They're going to suffocate you. And then you have to experiment. So we see that in um, the USSR, there's an experimentation with the war economy and, you know, war communism and so on. In all of these countries, in China, they have to experiment. Because, you know, we know now we have 100 years of history, Brian, of, of actually existing experiments. We know that, for instance, the Cambodia thing is a, is a debacle. It's a disaster. You don't take power to socialize poverty. You take power to advance the cause of humanity. For that, you need capital. How are you going to get it? These things are a real issue to be debated, discussed in a sober way. And again, unfortunately, the literature that's available that came at the anniversary, but even before, just doesn't take these things seriously. The anti-communist nature of the literature on the Russian Revolution is so significant 
uh, or those who basically hate the period after the death of Stalin. That literature is so significant that it doesn't allow us to see the depth of the, of the white terror, the terrorist attack on the USSR, Soviet Republic before that. And secondly, doesn't actually come to terms with the fact that to advance the cause of humanity, you have to assemble resources. And if you're denied resources in a poor country, it's a very big challenge. Even people sympathetic don't understand this because if you grasp the second problem, the lack of resources, the need to assemble them, if you grasp this problem, then you understand, you have more sympathy for how difficult it was to build socialism in the realm of necessity. You know, Marx had imagined socialism will be built in the realm of freedom. You already have an abundance of capital. You already have social wealth advance, the productive forces, and then you merely socialize them. But when you make a revolution in the poorer parts of the world, you have to do two things at the same time. You have to advance the productive forces and socialize them. This is a very difficult task. And, and I'm actually pleading with people to have more sympathy when they look at the revolutionary experiences in Vietnam, a country bombed to smithereens by the Americans and building socialism on essentially a graveyard of napalm is not easy. Building socialism in Cuba blockaded since 1961, not easy. Building a socialist project in Venezuela under heavy hybrid war conditions, not easy. You don't build socialism on a clean slate, on a tabula rasa. You build socialism in the world we live in. And I really do wish people look seriously at these projects critically as well, but not without understanding the actual context in which people are building on these uh, or experimenting in these ways. Vijay, uh, in addition to defending the revolution from the white terror in the 14 imperialist armies that invaded the country, in addition to building up the productive forces at a time when Russia was embargoed by the rest of the world, uh, literally blockaded, uh, literally and in a figurative sense, in an economic sense, but blockaded. So you have these two big tasks for the revolution, defend the revolution and start to provide for the masses of people. And, and the civil war, which was really part of a global class intervention against the Soviet Republic uh, between 1918 and 1920, three million more Russians are killed. I mean, that's on top of the millions who died in World War I. So the productive forces are about 14% of what they were in 1914, in 1920, when the socialist project is, is continuing. Now, just anybody, please imagine, what if you lost 86% 80 of what you take for granted in terms of what you have in your own household. I mean, the loss is amazing. But then there is a third task, a third task on top of those two, which Lenin uh, embraced. And it was a heroic endeavor, given the problem of building up the productive forces and defending the revolution, which was Lenin and the Bolsheviks decided to reorganize the socialist movement on a global basis. And they did that by creating a new international. There was the first international that Marx was the center of. Uh, and then there was the second international that started about 10 years later. Those were the beginning of parties, political parties, working class parties, social parties, socialist parties, or social democratic parties. In Germany, of course, a, a very successful endeavor. By 1910, one third of all of the members of the Reichstag were socialists. And it looked very promising that socialism could come to power and transform society legally and peacefully. And the, the Russian Revolution and the war that came before it shattered the existing socialist movement and Lenin embarks on the reorganization of the socialist movement by the creation of a new international, the Communist International. And I wanna talk to you because your book, Red Star Over the Third World, talks about the influence of this communist international in China, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, uh, all in, in the Middle East, in Latin America, the, the colonized and semi-colonized parts of the world, the majority, predominantly peasant societies, living under the yoke of colonialism. Uh, we only have to remember Lenin's book in 19... 
uh, 16, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. He analyzes the evolution of modern capitalism and says, look, colonialism, which was an important and central policy, is no longer a policy. It is the system of capitalism. And wars are now inevitable because the imperialists will go to war against each other over and over to redivide uh, territories and markets and colonies because the entire world is, in fact, colonized. So the Communist International, while hoping for revolution in the West, those, those prospects are dimmed and then dashed uh, between the failure of German revolution in 1918, in 1921, in 1923. That what had been the uh, initial hope. But you can see the Communist International has very promising uh, developments in the Third World. The Red Star now is coming over the Third World. And Marxism is moving east. The center of revolutionary gravity moving east, Marxism moving east. There are no longer German, French, and British uh, dominating sort of spheres of of Marxism. Marxism becomes a a doctrine for liberation in the third world. And I want to talk to you about that, and then I'm going to follow up with a question, because while it's promoting revolution and the reorganization of the socialist movement, as a, as a communist tendency, the Bolsheviks, they're also the leadership of a state, and they have to live as a state, as Lenin said, within a system of states, and that requires diplomacy. So there's the Russian or Soviet foreign ministry whose tasks are quite different from those of the common term, but inevitably there's a certain tension between the needs of the Soviet state and the needs of world revolution. But anyway, let's start with the development of the Comintern and how important that was in the third world. Well, uh, Brian, you talked about the white terror. You talked about the poverty that was there before the government. I'd like to add that there was also the influenza epidemic, the pandemic in 1918. And the Soviet Union pioneers social health, you know, what we call public health. It's a great pioneer. In fact, it's a direct line from the way the Soviet Union dealt with the influenza pandemic all the way to the Alma-Ata declaration of the World Health Organization in 1978, where they congratulate uh, the USSR for being a pioneer in public health. And I just wanted to add that because it's not like they had only this or that problem. They had the pandemic on top of everything else. And yet... And yet, in 1918, the pandemic is raging, influenza. You've got the white armies banging on the door. You've got poverty. You've got people just saying, give me bread. Forget everything else. Give me bread. Bring my uh, son back from the front. You know, people, that, those are their tangible demands. And yet, Lenin sitting in uh, the meeting says, let's have a communist international meeting next year. Let's bring as many people as we can who will cross enemy lines. They have to cross the white terror lines. They have to risk, in a way, um, influenza because they're going to come not only from Germany, but, you know, from the first meeting, admittedly, Brian was mainly from Western Europe, uh, some other parts of the world. But 1919 meeting was largely from Europe. And so they do come in 1919. They inaugurate the Communist International If anybody is interested at the leftward site, we have a volume called Liberate the Colonies, which I edited with Nazif Mullah and John Riddell. And it tells the whole story of colonialism and and the common turn. Because in 1919, Lenin is clear, we've got to reach out to other countries. He has this theory that the weakest link of imperialism doesn't exist in the factories of Manchester. It exists in places like India or in Egypt or in China and so on. So in 1920, that Comintern meeting is spectacular. People come from all over the world, you know. They come, they debate, and they learn. Because it's not just that they had the Communist International meeting in in Moscow or that they sent out Comintern agents to help other people. They set up a university for people from around the world to learn about Marxism, to learn about the tactics and strategy needed to make not if not revolutionary change, at least an anti-colonial movement. You know, they set up universities. They had a meeting in Baku, then in the Soviet Union, on the Congress of the Peoples of the East. They brought people, brought people from Iran, from the Ottoman Empire, from India, from China, to discuss amongst themselves about what is the task of the 
Asian Revolution. You know, next month I'll have a book out which is selections from Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh in Paris reads in the communist newspapers what Lenin is writing about colonialism and he says suddenly the sun seemed brighter. He rushes to Moscow. He becomes one of these people who goes to the university. Eventually he'll end up teaching there. He goes to the Comintern meeting. He's completely transfixed in 1922 when he sees all these brilliant people banging on the table saying, we will not, uh, you know, uh, accept uh, the status quo, we need to have a, a big, rich civilization. Even we in Indochina deserve a civilization. You know, we are not going to just produce the values that are then used to create civilization in France. After all, Ho Chi Minh had been to France. He looked around and he said, why is it that French people in France are politer than the French people that come to the colonies? But this was the experience of the USSR. This provided that experience. Then he goes to China and sets up a school in 1926-27 teaching Vietnamese exiles, Indo-Chinese exiles about revolution. These are lessons that he learns in Moscow. So Comintern plays an enormous role in essentially training thousands, tens of thousands of militants who go and, you know, many of them sacrifice themselves in their countries saying, we refuse to live in a condition of barbarism. We will be civilized. You know, you are not allowing us civilization. And that lesson comes from Moscow. You know, I was very interested, Brian, in reading biographies of people who went to these universities, um, including the University of the Toilers of the East and so on. And they said, in these universities, the first time I got to meet people from other continents, we got to exchange ideas, see how similar our experiences are. But also it's the first time we got to read literature, you know, novels, to listen to poets from other parts of the world. And it's these people that then set up in Moscow an enormous publishing enterprise uh, through later progress publishers, but earlier different Soviet publishers, foreign language press and so on. And they started to translate, say, writers from Latin America and distribute them in Asia. You know, in fact, the so-called uh, global or international appreciation of art and culture comes through the Soviet Union. The Soviets didn't say everybody around the world should read European literature. They were actually taking a writer, say, from Chile, translating them and distributing them in China. You know, I as a young child, this is, of course, later in 1970s, I read world literature. I read Ding Ling. I read Ngugiwa Thongo all in editions produced by the, the, the Soviet Union, you know, not, not from Heinemann publishers or, or other European publishers, but the Soviets. The Soviets encouraged this very much because they felt that our level of global culture must be raised. It's not just that we need freedom from colonialism or that we need freedom from the yoke of capitalism. We're not just fighting against something. We're fighting for something. We're fighting to create humanity. And I think there's no better evidence of that than in the early years of the Communist International where these people came, they came together, they talked to each other, they built from each other, and they sort of learned that we're not just anti-colonial, we are pro-human. We're not just anti-imperial. We want to build a socialist society. A socialist society, in case people have doubts about that phrase, is a synonym for humanity. That's what it is. Because... Under a capitalist system, we don't have humanity. We have a system divide, which divides people along the hideousness of class. You know, it's difficult to be human in a system where somebody has all the wealth. 22 of the richest people in the world have more wealth than all the women in Africa. That's not humanity. That's barbaric. We want to, you know, constitute humanity. And, and as I say, when we talk about socialism, that's another word for humanity. Yeah, so important. Let's, uh, and, and by the way, real quick, I, this is a perhaps a digression, but the other part in your book where you talk about, and I'm talking about the humanity and the cultural sort of impact of the Russian Revolution and the Soviet Union. The Soviets, I mean, the Soviet Union was a truly multinational uh, enterprise. And big parts of the, of the population that were not Russian had been so oppressed by the Russian Empire and so held down. And, and the Soviet Union lifted them up. I mean, uh, it doesn't mean that there weren't imperfections and defects, 
but with such a range of nationalities and languages. I think in your book you're talking about how the Soviet system, the Soviet government actually prioritized creating alphabets in languages where there had been no alphabets. In other words, not insisting that everyone learn Russian and they only speak Russian, but the elevation of the cultural levels of those who had been the most oppressed culturally and nationally. Just talk about that for a second, then I want to go back to the Communist International. Sure. In 1915, Lenin had written a series of articles. He was debating Rosa Luxemburg on the question of nationalism. And he wrote these articles about self-determination or the, you know, the question of, of the nationalities. In fact, Stalin had also written, contributed to this debate and so on. Uh, it's an interesting debate. And in this debate, you get a real sense that Lenin is worried about what he calls great Russian chauvinism. Um, that, you know, if we do constitute some sort of experiment, let it not fall prey uh, to a nationalism where the dominant section uh, imposes its culture on other people. And I think that's a great sensitivity. Uh, you know that he's coming to this idea because he understands the Tsarist empire really as, as well as anybody. He understands that, you know, if you're a Chechnyan, if you're a Uzbek, if you're a, a Tatar or a, a Azeri or whatever, you are not interested in a new project which is going to impose its culture on you. So at the same time, as you see in other parts of the world, um, the suffocation of difference, you know, uh, this is also so in, in, in Britain. You know, if you look in Britain at the time, the persecution of the Gaelic language and so on, Persecution of the Gaelic language is happening around the same time. In the Easter Rising of 1916, proximate uh, event, one of the things is that they were proud to speak Gaelic and they didn't want the English yoke. You know, they, 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 the language question is there as well. Well, here Lenin says, no, we're going to promote other people's languages, which is also our language. And the number of institutes that are created in Uzbekistan, in what was then later Uzbekistan, SSR, Soviet Socialist Republic, in places they created institutes to, uh, you know, advance the language through creating grammars, to promoting the writing of literature in these languages and so on. I mean, I, I fear that this is a, a, an example that we should return to now, Brian. If I look at India, which is also a multi-ethnic, multinational country. You know, India has uh, hundreds of languages. Um, the government is trying to suffocate people saying we all are Hindus. We must all write and read Hindi and so on. Why? You know, why not understand the richness, the diverseness of human existence and let it be? I'm not saying we should all be engaged in zoos, you know. You must only speak your own language like a like an animal in a zoo. You are the Uzbeks. You must speak Uzbek. No, you can speak three languages, but we must not allow Uzbek to disappear. Um, it's an it's a really interesting example because it it befits us today to look at uh, at a time in the United States when you know uh, it's been through decades of anti-Spanish. You know how people will talk in the United States. I've experienced that. Will people will say, I, I only speak English or English only movements and things like that. It's the exact opposite. Why English only? Let people uh, contribute to the human story in languages in which they are comfortable. If we want, you know, you're in Chicago, let the Polish immigrants speak in Polish. Let them develop Polish literature. Well, of course, there needs to be languages in common to communicate, but we are not going to be monolingual people. We should enrich our world, have a diverse world. And that's exactly as a consequence of the fear of what they call great Russian chauvinism. They actually put resources into promoting a cultural diversity. And I think that's a considerable feat. It wasn't a passive acceptance that people will speak other languages. It was an active state policy uh, to promote the diversity of culture and cultural worlds. Let's go back then to the Communist International, and it's in competition with world imperialism. British imperialism is still the dominant imperialism, but American imperialism is the rising power coming out of World War I. And uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, becomes the spokesperson for the cause of self-determination at the same time that the Communist International puts on its banners uh, in, in primary colors, the issue of self-determination. And of course, they meant two, two very, very different things. 
Uh, in fact, at one of the later Congresses of the, of the Communist International, one of the key slogans uh, from Marx, workers of the world unite, is altered at one of the subsequent Congresses to say workers and oppressed people of the world unite, recognizing that it's not simply the class struggle of the proletariat, uh, it's the struggle of whole nations. And of course, these are cross-class entities, uh, but they're oppressed as a people or as a nation by imperialism. Let's talk about self-determination, what Lenin means and what Woodrow Wilson means. Yeah, this is very interesting. And we have super material on all this stuff, you know, because you've got Wilson making the statement about self-determination in 1919, um, right after you have these two statements of self-determination, Lenin's is out there, Wilson's is out there. 1919, there's movement across the third world, whether it's in China, the May 4th movement, or it's in Egypt, in India, after Jallianwala Bagh, there's a big uprising. And so 1919 is like the 1968 of the anti-colonial movement. You know, a whole generation is formed in the uprising of 1919. Well, there was a book written by a Harvard historian about 10 years ago who made the argument that, well, this was Woodrow Wilson's uprising. You know, he, he, he said that they were inspired by Wilson. Actually, they were not inspired by Wilson. They were inspired by their struggles. They merely saw Wilson's statement as an opening. Now that Wilson has said the 14 points, let's say we are going to rise up to demand that you uh, live by your 14 points. But many of them privately and in public as well said that what inspired them was, was the USSR. Because after all, after having created uh, the Soviet Republic, they said that other nationalities will be respected and they can have their own um, you know, uh, uh, projects within the USSR, within the, the overarching framework of the USSR. P people should remember that the USSR stands for the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics with a capital S. And many of these republics are nationalities like the Uzbek nationality and so on. So th it's important that this is what they look to and said, we would like something like that. You know, if the Ottoman Empire is falling apart right now, uh, can we have different nationalities form their republics? And you see, Lenin had argued that nationalities should have the right to secede from a, from a formation and then come back on their own terms. Uh, because they all understood that small states are isolated and easy to dominate by imperialism. So you want a confederation of states. And the USSR was a confederation of independent republics. That's how they understood it. It's also true, Brian, and I'd like to just put this on the record that later a bureaucratic mentality crept in and many of the smaller nationalities with their own republics were not setting the agenda, that they, it was being imposed on them. This debate about great Russian chauvinism actually goes all the way into the 80s. Uh, it, it's a constant theme like, no, come on, we need more of a say. We don't want to just get our orders dictated from Moscow. And I think one should see that this is a real process and struggle. Old habits die hard. And if you come from a nationality that has a sort of, you know, majoritarian uh, outlook to the world, it's not easy to understand that you have to actually listen to somebody from what you think of as the provinces. You know, if I live in, in, in Dushanbe, I don't think I live in the provinces. I think I live in the middle of the world. But Moscow might see me as the provinces. And that attitude, it takes three, four generations to wash that out. And of course, the USSR didn't have that time. So what I would like just put about Wilson is Wilson put this on the table, Brian. But then when the League of Nations is taking place, very quickly, the US uh, negotiators accept two things, which, which really should be there when analyzing Wilson. One is they accepted the fact that the colonial peoples don't have a right to be at the table. Um, you know, again, Ho Chi Minh puts a plea to the French, like, what about our positions? And the French say, forget it. And Wilson didn't actually fight for the colonial peoples to have a voice there. And secondly, they accepted this idea that in the collapsed Ottoman Empire, the colonial powers should come in and have what are called mandates, that the colonial powers will be the parents of the Syrians or the parents of the Palestinians. And the Palestinians will not be allowed to have a free, a free, free run on their society, control themselves. So the United States accepted, you know, on the one side, Wilson is talking self-determination. On the other side, they actually promote the idea of mandates. 
uh, to give the French and the British, you know, allow them to have the Sykes-Picot Accord where France took Syria and Britain took Palestine and Jordan and so on. I mean, that's old imperialism. That's the dividing up of Africa taking place at a time when Wilson's language of, you know, self-determination is in the air. They didn't mean it, but the Soviets meant it and struggled with it and didn't always succeed, but this was important to them. Mao Zedong uh, didn't travel very much outside of China. He only, he only left the country once. Uh, that was after the Chinese Revolution in October 1949. They come to power. Mao gives that amazing speech in Tiananmen Square. He says, China has stood up, meaning it's not simply uh, on the road to socialism or communism. It stood up, meaning the that China has unified and stood up and rejected and expelled those from the outside who had imposed their will, their domination over China. The century of humiliation is ended. And then Mao goes to Moscow and engages in a very protracted set of discussions with Stalin and with the other parts of the Soviet leadership. He was the leader of a very large assembly of Chinese officials and technicians, and they hammer out what becomes the Sino-Soviet friendship agreement. But even though Mao had never traveled to the Soviet Union before 1949, the Soviet Union and the Communist International had a profound impact on the development of the Chinese people. You know, it's very interesting, Vijay, one of the things I liked about your book was you, you called the October Revolution not real. You didn't. You didn't describe it as the negation, really, of the February Revolution. Even though, in some ways, it's the negation. You you said it was necessary to defend the revolution, and in many ways, the Chinese youth and young activists who formed the May Fourth Movement, which Mao was part of, uh, they're a they're a prologue to the 1911 revolution. In a way, they're they they become communists partly because of the Communist International, but they're trying to save the revolution, which is in, in crisis. And I think that theme of you need a second revolution not to fully negate the original bourgeois revolution or bourgeois nationalist or bourgeois democratic revolution, but to save it, to save its most important elements. I think that's an extremely important and correct way to, to look at this process. But let's talk about what the Comintern's impact was on the Chinese Revolution, and it wasn't all good, but it certainly was very impactful. And I want to ask you first just how it, how the Russian Revolution impacted the minds of young Chinese activists in 1919, 1920, 21, and then a follow-up. We're going to talk about not just Mao, but also Chiang Kai-shek and his relationship uh, to the Communist International. Well, you know, the first thing just to say is that I'm interested in the fact that you have, you know, millions of young people in 1917 uh, in places like China, India, you know, around the third world, in colonized parts of the world, millions. And I, I don't use the that number uh, in a hyperbolic way. I mean it. Uh, millions of young people who, when they read about the revolution, not in 1917, because there was no social media, no CNN, thank God. Uh, they got newspaper accounts of it in 1918, in 1919, and so on. Um, they admired what had happened. You know, I looked at a lot of the press in India and some of it in China, and people, they look at what's happening and say, what have they done? You know, peasants are going to rule. What have they done? It was enormously influential just in, in terms of that idea. So the idea of the revolution is very important. Secondly, the very fact that a revolution is possible of this kind in, a, in the modern world. You see, every people, Brian, believes that, well, a revolution might have been possible earlier. You know, in the French Revolution, the forces of repression, the state was not so powerful. You could assemble a band of people, bring your pitchforks and march. It was possible. Then now we might say, well, the Russian Revolution was possible because, you know, the state didn't have, they had informers, but they were not so sophisticated. As modern states get more and more sophisticated, repressive in certain ways, their surveillance techniques are better, as the ideological work they do is better, it always looks harder to do it now. It's easy to do it in the past. You know, it's, it's a funny thing. 
So in 1917, 18, 19, people are saying, how did they do it in this modern state? It's not so easy to overthrow the state. You know, may have been easier in 1789. Not they, if they do it, we can do it. That's one. And and you know that in in the writings, not of Mao. Mao was not exactly immediately impacted at the time, but a lot of his teachers and others, uh, intellectuals of of his era, and and people who were in politics, including Chiang Kai Shek, were quite amazed that they were able to do this and secure it. So the admiration for the USSR actually starts in around 1926, 27, 28, when people say, wow, they're act not, they have, not, have they, not only have they done a revolution, but they've built a revolutionary process. And the admiration therefore comes about a decade into what's going on there. In China, uh, there is a mixed record because you see, you've, created a revolution, you created the Soviet Republic, then the USSR, um, amazing and so on. But you have a dual uh, problem. One, you in 1919 create the common turn to basically help other people make a revolution. Incredible. That's one uh, thing we've already talked about that. But the second, which you intimated earlier is diplomacy. You are also a country in the world. You have your own national interests or your state interests to maintain. You also have to make deals with other countries. You need to get, you know, trade going, world trade. You have to sell your produce to somebody. You have to buy technology from somewhere else and so on. So that problem that the Soviets face, that double problem, all revolutionary governments face. That means that your uh, accelerating other people's revolutionary agendas is sometimes curtailed by your own diplomatic needs, your own state needs. I think this is a normal thing. There's nothing sinister in it. And what it meant was at times the USSR said, look, we don't really want too much uh, encouragement of revolution inside the British Empire because we're trying to cut a deal with the British over some trade thing. That's a perfectly normal and acceptable thing. We have to understand that because they also have a problem. They have internal famines that they have to sort out. They need to get machinery for certain factories and so on. This is a constant tension inside the common turn. Because members, say, from China come and they are told, no, no, you know, we think you should do this. And they, they just chafe at the, uh, at the orders coming from Moscow. So that Moscow giving orders is a problem and, and is a problem right until uh, the Soviet Union decides to close down the Comintern in 1943. Of course, the problem will go on after that, but just in that specific instance. But secondly... In 1922, oh, well, sorry, 1920, a debate breaks out inside the Comintern, which is a serious debate about political strategy. And that's the debate that in colonies, what is the nature of the national bourgeoisie? So in India, how are the elites reacting to imperialism? Are they going to collaborate with imperialism? Or those elites that decide to join the anti-imperialist to anti-colonial struggle, you know, led by Gandhi at the time, uh, are they going to be a ally of the working class movement? And the debate that breaks out between Lenin on the one hand, who says one should be conciliatory to the national bourgeoisie, where the national bourgeoisie has a patriotic content. He, is, he faces a contest from M.N. Roy. Roy is a revolutionary from Bengal, where I was born but actually is representing Mexico because he was at the time in Mexico City. Talk about internationalism. You know, um, uh, there's a famous Japanese communist, uh, you know, uh, who represents the United States Communist Party, but he's right. born and brought up in Japan. So the communist movement is quite interesting like that. But to come back to this point, in fact, the debate in hindsight between Lenin and Roy is not really a debate. It's a, it's a discussion about strategy and tactics in different locations because both were right in certain instances where the bourgeoisie under pressure from imperialism is more patriotic it could be an ally in other instances where it doesn't have uh, that those problems from imperialism it could be an, an adversary so actually this is cast as a major debate it's not a major debate they set the terms for a serious uh, discussion in the commenton that lasts a generation how should a left project in a country like India, um, you know, position itself vis-a-vis -vis its domestic bourgeoisie? This is a debate that goes to the 1950s, 
opens up in the Indian Communist Movement. Indian Communist Movement splits in 1964 along the lines of the Roy uh, Lenin debate. You know, it, it's incredible. Till today, this debate has a resonance because we're still debating how to deal with our allies in the bourgeoisie. Are they actual allies or do we take, are we taking advantage of them or are they taking advantage of us? You know, that's the kind of, of question to ask. So what happens is that because of the contours of this debate in the common turn, uh, Moscow feels that it should tell China what to do at different times. You've got to collaborate with the Gomindang led by, you know, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, or you've got to not collaborate. And there are different phases. And this is something that eventually irritates Mao a lot because Mao feels like, stop telling us what to do. We'll make our own revolution. But, you know, Mao doesn't see it as a zero-sum game because, as you say, the major only trip he makes really is to the USSR. And that debate that he has uh, with the Soviet government over the treaty is a really important debate because, you know, it's actually one of the first times that the Soviets had to deal with a um, with another communist, major communist government coming and saying, no, we're going to negotiate as equals. Um, because, you know, that's 1950. In 1960, early 60s, when Che Guevara goes for a similar kind of dispute, he says the Soviets have to learn to deal with us as people. We are not colonies of the Soviet Union, you know, we, and we have to recognize that this tension existed. Again, it's not to blame anybody. This is just a, these are the fundamental tensions that exist in the world. It's not that the Soviets are putting this tension on the world. It's These are the tensions in the world. And the Soviets manifest those tensions about what is the national interest of a state and then what is internationalism. And I think that's really where the China question opened up a lot. They were debating, for God's sake, a border. Where should the border be? Where should the railway line be in you know, the Manchuria, Mongolia region? Who should own the railway line? The uh, old Russian concession was on that railway line. Chinese said, we want it back. I mean, they were disputing resources, borders, things that any government disputes, whether bourgeois or socialist. Because these are problems imposed by the world upon us. You know, what is the border between two states? It's not a socialist debate or a communist debate. This is the mere normal debate of two states that abut each other. They'll have border disputes. They will have disputes about resources and so on. Unfortunately, the Soviets and the Russians, for historical reasons, could not actually deal with those debates, Brian, until just a few years ago when Putin and Xi Jinping finally said, look, let's close the border question. Isn't that amazing? Indeed, especially when you think that the Communist Party of the Soviet Union is no more. So as, when they were communists and, and communist cadres and communist comrades, the dispute became not only unmanaged, but turned comrades into enemies. And once the Soviet Communist Party was gone, Putin, as the national leader of Russia, could at least recognize the national interests of uh, Russia were with China. Uh, and again, that is a reciprocal relationship in relationship to imperialism's attitude towards the both of them. And that's another element in all of these calculations is that it's not simply disputes between two countries that are normal disputes. It's also in the context where imperialism is constantly looking for vulnerability, looking for division, looking for differences of opinion, magnifying them, uh, you know, amplifying them, exaggerating them in order to carry out the traditional divide and conquer tactic, and which, which was you know, well perfected during the Sino-Soviet dispute. But, but I want to I wanna go back, and, and because part of what we're doing, and I know time is running short now, we've been talking and talking, but uh, <laughs> part of our series is to try to have a historical materialist attitude or hist uh, way of I examining the Soviet Union and its impact rather than the history of heroes and traitors, rather than are you for Mao, or are you for Stalin, are you for Trotsky, et cetera, et cetera. Like, instead of looking at these debates through the, the lens of personalities and le leaders where this is bourgeois history, the history of heroes and traitors or of great men, we're looking to the historical, materialist, objective understanding, still partisan, still pro-socialist, uh, 
but with that sort of you know, realistic appraisal. And when you think about even the, the tensions that the, the Soviet Union had in 1926 and 27, where they're encouraging Mao in, to work with and under the Kuomintang, under Chiang Kai-shek, in the, in the campaign to unify China, which ultimately leads to the debacle in, the, in Shanghai and the, the massacres and the follow-up massacre in Canton and the, the breaking up of this alliance, uh, the Soviets were trying to break out of isolation. And, they, and Chiang Kai-shek was looking also to the common turn. Uh, as you alluded to, I mean, and as you write in your book, I mean, it wasn't simply the communists in China. The bourgeois nationalists were also looking to the Soviet Union for aid and support. And Chiang Kai-shek, in fact, was seated in common turn commissions. Um, but then you go back to 1945, and I think this is, the reason I want to mention this is you, you put out there just now that Mao didn't see all of this as a zero-sum game. He was also a as, you know, assessing this from a realistic understanding. So 1945, the Soviet Union has defeated fascism, but at the cost of 26, 27 million Soviets, they need to rebuild. The US has just dropped the atomic bombs, it's on the war path. And so revolutionary prospects in, in now are developing in Greece, in Italy, in France, in China, in Korea, in Vietnam. And, you know, the Soviet message, in Europe at least, is to moderate. Like, don't go for revolution. Uh, certainly the Italian and French Communist parties were not encouraged to maintain the armed struggle when they could have presumably, possibly, seized the power and created socialist countries because the Soviet Union felt that would be a tripwire or a red line and U.S. imperialism would start World War III and hold them responsible. Same with Greece, where, uh, you know, the arms that were needed by Greek partisans weren't forthcoming, maybe from Yugoslavia, but not necessarily from other places. And in the case of China, 1945, the Soviets are recommending to Mao uh, enter into negotiations to form a unity government under the leadership of Chiang Kai-shek, even though they've been fighting now for 22 years in the Chinese Red Army controls vast parts of China. The Soviets don't really want revolution anywhere after World War II because they really want peace. They want a period uh, of peace where they can rebuild. And so Mao says yes to Stalin in the Soviet Union. Yes, I'll engage in uh, negotiations which begin in 45. Yes, we're gonna seek a national unity government. But in reality, they're doing their own thing, which is to continue the civil war, to develop their own military forces, with the aid, by the way, of North Korean partisans who have come. North Korea already has state power in 1945. So they engage in the civil war, and at the end of that five-year period, that or four-year period, the communists win. And Chiang Kai-shek flees to Taiwan, and, and Stalin and the Soviets who told Mao, don't do this, immediately welcome the Chinese Communist Party to Moscow and develop the Sino-Soviet friendship. I mean, this is a remarkable set of contradictory events, but again, rooted in sort of the framework that you've laid out. Well, it's in a way a repeat of 1917, 1918. You know, the revolution took place in Asia, three revolutions, I'll get to them in a minute, but didn't take place in France, Italy, and Greece in the same way as the German revolution was snuffed out in 18 and then twice in the 20s. Um, the, there are three revolutions in Asia after World War II. One is in, uh, not in Korea, as you say, in the northern part of Korea. It actually could have gone all the way down the peninsula, but because of the aggression, uh, it was prevented. The second was in... Um, in, in Indochina, in Vietnam, because Ho Chi Minh goes to Hanoi uh, for the first time in his life enters Hanoi and gives a speech saying, you know, we are here for life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And the, uh, the French, uh, the Japanese, uh, the United States tried to prevent it. You know, they, they tried to suffocate it. But Ho Chi Minh as well is perfectly happy to create a, 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 a you know, a broad government. He, he didn't want a communist government. He said anybody can come. In fact, it's interesting that it's even in, in China, 
Mao does say, I'm happy to make a national government, but it's the it's the uh, Kuomintang that's not interested at all because Chiang Kai-shek thinks he deserves to win and he wants to rid the country of the communists. It's the same in Vietnam. You know, the, the oligarchy wanted to come back, including the old monarch wanted to come back and rule, whether it's with French guns or American guns or even Japanese guns. Um, then in, in, Indo in Indonesia, Indonesia had the largest communist party outside China. They could have won easily. You know, in fact, there was a couple of uprisings in 1948 and so on. But certainly by the 50s, they could have triumphed. Uh, they had the largest party in, in Indonesia. And there, of course, it all ends in the bloody coup of 1965, where between one and three million communists and sympathizers were wiped out. It's the bloodiest period in Asia that we have seen, you know, lots of focus is on Mao. They keep saying, Mao, you did this genocide, that genocide. What about what happened in Indonesia in 1965? Completely forgotten in popular memory. But the point I'm coming to, uh, Brian, is that, you see, the thing is that communists also learn to be conciliatory towards reality because, you know, you understand what your abilities are, the balance of forces, what you can accelerate, what you can accelerate without uh, too much human suffering, without also obliterating yourself. You know, in 1943, the common turn, the Communist International is wound up. Uh, that's two years before the war ends, because it's a sense that the Soviets had after the Battle of Stalingrad, that we will really take 10, 15 years to rebuild our country. We have been devastated. You know, we, the Soviets took the brunt of the fight against the Nazis. Uh, the Soviets were the ones who liberated the remaining Jews who were in the concentration camps. It was the Soviets who liberated Auschwitz. It wasn't the American GIs who did it. You know, I mean, th there is something there in that story that's important. And that made them hesitate. We can't fight a war, uh, uh, you know, that goes now against the United States. Remember, the Russian Revolution took place because Soviet, the Russian troops didn't want to fight anymore in the Great War of, of 1914. They wanted to exit the war. That was the accelerant for the Russian Revolution. Stalin understood that lesson. After all, he was the one, Brian, who went and organized troops in 1980, sorry, 1916, 17. He was organizing the troops. He was like telling the troops, come back, mutiny, join our forces, and so on. He well knew that you can't send soldiers to fight over and over again, particularly in an unwinnable war. If a nuclear bomb was dropped on Moscow, would that have been a good answer? They understood their balance of forces. Mao also understood his balance of forces. He knew that in China, after the Kuomintang had deliberately bombed a dam and flooded an entire district, killing hundreds of thousands of Chinese people in order to facilitate their retreat from the advancing Japanese forces, the, the kind of the way in which the Chinese people looked at the Kuomintang by 1945 was in a very negative way. And Mao knew that. He knew he could press the advantage. So he understood his balance of forces. I think one of the important lessons in this is that you can't centralize an assessment of the world revolution. You've got to let people who are in the middle of their own struggles determine the best tactics and strategy. We have a lot of armchair people who sit far away condemning the left here, there and everywhere. They are making this mistake, that mistake. And surely one should. But it's the attitude. You know, you've got to know that people have an understanding of what's going on. You know, I'm not an idealist. I recognize that in very many parts of the world, we are not in a revolutionary situation. Objectively, capitalism is, is in a grave, even perhaps fatal crisis. But subjectively, we are not in a revolutionary situation in many parts of the world. The key classes, the working class, the peasantry and so on, they are not in the mood for a revolutionary struggle, for a fight against uh, you know, the states in which they live. In India, there was a massive fight by the farmers. But that's not a revolutionary struggle. They were fighting to defend the constitution. They were defighting, fighting for the recall of three bills passed in parliament. Don't mistake farmers on the street with red flags with a hammer and sickle. Don't mistake that for a revolutionary situation. You have to look and see what the farmers are thinking. They believe still in the importance of the parliament. They believe that the parliament can reverse the bills and can advance their goals and so on. So that, that's a, to me, if I look at the you know, world historical perspective, I look at it from a historical materialist way. 
the history of revolutions, I will see how you have to understand the correlation of forces, how you must understand the levels of, of, of where people are, how they are thinking, what they're capable of, whether they are willing to a really difficult, really, really difficult fight against the state at that point, against the hideous, wretched ruling class at that point. A party makes a determination to accelerate the struggle when it feels that the people are ready to accelerate the struggle. Otherwise, you are substituting yourself for the people. And that is an enormous act of arrogance. And so I think the Soviet leadership in 43, 44, 45 understood that, look, we can't accelerate the revolution from our standpoint because we are in a great position of weakness. Mao looking at it from China says, we are going to press our advantage here. Both are right because they are in different contexts. Unfortunately, uh, there was a, a sense that one was telling the other not to do it for their own reasons. So some antipathy grew. But what antipathy? In 1950, Mao goes and has a very successful meeting uh, with the Soviet leadership. So again, you know, it's a zigzag, as old Freddie Engels used to say. Uh, one can't have a one-sided view of anything. Today, you have a dispute. Tomorrow, you shake hands. That's how comrades operate. Indeed. And, and, you know, Lenin wrote that seminal work, uh, Left Wing Communism in Infantile Disorder. Um, sometimes we have a senile disorder in some of the groups, uh, uh, but something similar. Um, but, you know, his point and your point is so important, which is that you can't understand even the Bolshevik success in the re revolution if you just look at the moment of revolution. How did they deal with all the other stages and phases of their own development where they were on the, on the heel, where they were set back, they were, where they were retreating, where by you know, just two years after the 1905 revolution, Lenin says in a letter to a friend, the number of cadre I can count on now, I can count on the fingers of both hands. I mean, I mean, it's two years after you have a revolution, but they don't give up. They just keep going and going. They, they never give up. But they're, they're, they have to enter into political work in the Duma, the fake parliament that the Tsar has set up, this, this mirage, this fig leaf for Tsarism. But they're in it because the revolutionary field doesn't open at that moment. And he says if you really want to understand the Bolsheviks or be like the Bolsheviks, understand the whole history. Don't just understand the, the period where we're heroically you know, taking the Winter Palace. Look at all the other stages and phases. And... And one of the reasons that you know, we wanted to do this series, again, about the Soviet Union, but to talk about the evolution of Marxism and how, and I want to end on this, Vijay, is how, how Marxism not only, socialism not only went to the East and to the South after the Russian Revolution, but, but so did Marxism, the, the ideas of Marxism. It, it's no longer, it, it was born where the class struggle in the heart of capitalism began, which was in Europe. But then you have all of Asia entering this revolutionary conflagration after World War II and even before, in the Middle East and Africa. And then this miracle of the Cuban Revolution, 90 miles from Florida, a little tiny island uh, has a revolution. It doesn't announce itself as a communist revolution, but it says we want to lower rents. Uh, we want to help the people. We want to lower the phone bill, and AT&T owns the, all of the communication. So that'll, that sets in motion a coup d'etat effort by the U.S. government. And the Cubans would have undoubtedly been destroyed, no matter how heroic they were, just the relationship of forces. But you, here's the Soviet Union, thousands of miles away, and at the moment of the gravest crisis for Cuba, the Soviets and the socialist camp were there. And that's why Cuba could survive. The, the reason in 1972 the Vietnamese could shoot down 25% of the U.S. B-52 fleet was they had surface-to-air missiles. They, they couldn't make those missiles. Those were made in the Soviet Union or in Czechoslovakia or East Germany. So you had a, an era of, in spite of the retreats, the setbacks, the divisions, a period of expanding revolution because of the existence of the so Soviet Union and the socialist camp, in spite of the fact that there was Stalin, then Khrushchev, then Brezhnev, and people had this orientation or that orientation. The mere existence of this 
social force on a global scale tilted the balance of forces so that the colonized or semi-colonized revolting people in Africa or in Latin America or the Middle East could gain some advantage. And then, you know, following the destruction of the Soviet Union, it began what, what we here, at least in our milieu, call the era of global counter-revolution. And it doesn't mean the struggle stops. It doesn't mean the aspirations and dreams uh, for, for liberation and independence uh, go away. They, they take a different form. In Latin America, instead of it being a Cuban-style armed struggle, it manifested itself through the electoral process. Not exclusively, but you saw it in Venezuela, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Honduras. Uh, you know, it's, it finds a way to manifest itself again, but on a different terrain because there's been this terrible defeat. What Fidel called the biggest defeat for the working class in history was the destruction of the Soviet Union. So we're fighting, VJ. I want to get your final words on this. We're still fighting the same fight, but on a different political or social terrain. But it doesn't mean that this situation is permanent. It doesn't mean that it will even necessarily be long lasting. We don't, you never know where you are in the historical continuum until later. Uh, Rosa Parks would not have known the day before she refused to give up her seat that she was going to ignite the civil rights revolution in America. She wouldn't know. It's only later that you know. So we don't know where we are until later, but we know we have to keep fighting. But again, in a way, starting over. Your final thoughts. Starting over, yes, but we start over almost every day. You know, we, we learn things, we grow and so on. You know, Brian, I often tell people that if you can convince me that the solution to the barbarity in our world it can be in the hands of capitalism, then I might embrace capitalism and abandon socialism, you know, but you can't because you can't show me any way in which you can solve these crises. You know, the crisis of, of poverty, uh, 2.7 billion people don't know where they're going to eat. This is a barbarous world we live in. You know, it, I shudder when I think about how, how horrible these countries are that don't permit vaccines to be sent all around the world and so on. Uh, where are the capitalist medical brigades that go all around the world? No, it's Cuban medical brigades. It's Chinese medical brigades. They go around the world. Show me the capitalist medical brigade. Show me the capitalist solidarity. You know, uh, shiploads of, of, of va vaccines being sent to places. Um, I don't see it. I, I just don't see it. I think the actual... Utopians are those who believe, or the actual idealists are those who believe that capitalism can solve things. They are the real idealists. They've been living with an idealism for a long time. Socialists are the realistic ones. We believe that this system cannot solve the problems, and yet we fight to create solutions within this system as the same time we fight to overcome this system. You know, you and I are not going to say, let's wait till socialism. We are going to fight to vaccinate everybody now. We are going to fight to feed everybody now. We're going to fight to give education and culture to everybody now. At the same time as we understand, this system can't do it. But that's what makes socialism such a difficult fight. And I want people to understand that. You know, it's not a choice between reform and revolution. If you actually bother to read Rosa Luxemburg's book, you'll recognize she's not saying, hey, guys, you have to make a choice. You either become a reformist or you become a revolutionary. No, that's not what she's saying. You have to fight to solve the concrete problems of working people now. And you have to understand that the full solution for uh, the humiliations in the world are not going to be found now. They will be found later when we inaugurate a new system. But both have to be done. And man, that makes the work much harder, infinitely harder. At the same time, it makes the work humane because we are trying to solve the problems now. We are human beings. You know, th there's a line that I quote a lot, Brian, from a great 18th century Indian poet, Admi Tha Badi Mushkil Se Insan Hua. We were people with great difficulty, we became human. You know, this Badi Mushkil, this with great difficulty, we need to absorb that. Socialism is not just, uh, you know, you just flick your fingers and socialism comes magic, open sesame and the door opens to socialism. 
it's a difficult difficult struggle a lot of sacrifice a lot of people die get hurt um, you know a lot of comrades have you know tough time in this struggle i always tell people cheer up a little bit treat each other with some dignity you know we are in a long road we don't have to fight with viciousness against each other we must fight with principle and we have to advance our cause we have to expand our ranks we have to reach out to people we are not cultists we want to make humanity that's a big big task all right we're going to leave it right there we were joined by a prolific author vijay prashad vijay you've written so much i i don't even know how and you're traveling and you're speaking but i want to encourage everyone to get this book red Star over the third world, published by Pluto Press. Vijay Prashad, thanks so much. It's my pleasure, Blind. My pleasure.